Welcome back to my channel. My name is Jordan. I'm an attorney. I break things down and make things really easy for everyone to understand. I talk about everything related to the law, including high profile cases, the death penalty, my journey throughout law school, getting to be a lawyer, all of that fun stuff. Today, we're going to talk about the high profile case of Casey Anthony. It captivated the nation's attention in 2008 when she was put on trial for the murder of her two year old daughter. And I'm going to let you in on all of the evidence everything that happened and why at the end of the day she was found not guilty. So let's get into it. The story starts in 2005 when Casey Anthony gave birth to Kaylee Anthony. The father of Kaylee Anthony is unknown and interestingly enough throughout Casey's pregnancy she denied ever even being pregnant but she ultimately had Kaylee Anthony like I said in 2005. Kaylee Anthony was raised in Casey's parents home. Casey lived there as well. One night in June, specifically June 15th, Casey and her parents got into an argument. The next day on June 16th, Casey drove off with her daughter Kaylee and they were not seen or heard from for about a month. A month after Casey drives off, Casey's father hears that the family car, which Casey took when she drove off, had been impounded. He went to get the car and noticed that the car smelled really, really bad, like a dead body had been in there. So Casey's mom finally gets a hold of Casey after her being gone for a month, starts asking her questions, you know, what's been going on, what's been happening, and Casey admits to her that Kaylee Anthony was kidnapped a while back, like a month ago, and she just never reported it because she was trying to figure it out on her own. So Casey's mother freaks out, calls 911. She says, you need to arrest my daughter. Not only does the car smell like a dead body, but now she says that her daughter, Kaylee, has been missing for a month and it was never reported. No one knows what happened to her. So Casey gets arrested. She is charged with child neglect, lying to investigators, as well as interfering with a criminal investigation because up until this point, she had lied to investigators about various things. She lied about her employment with Universal Studios. She even went so far as to take the officers on a tour of her work at Universal Studios. Halfway through the tour, admitted to them that she had actually been fired years ago and was just pretending to still work there. She said that her daughter had been kidnapped on June 9th by the nanny, Zanita Gonzalez, took them to a vacant apartment where the nanny allegedly had lived at one point and ran away from, but it turns out that the nanny didn't even exist. Like, she Kaylee Anthony didn't have a nanny and not only that but she said that Kaylee Anthony had been kidnapped on June 9th but as we know this fight between Casey Anthony and her parents erupted on June 15th so that couldn't have been possible because Casey ran away with her daughter on June 16th so nothing's adding up so that's why she got the charge for lying to investigators and interfering with a criminal investigation on top of the child neglect charge. And then in July, Casey is declared a person of interest at a bond hearing. At this bond hearing, there was evidence presented to the judge that a cadaver dog had honed in on the scent of a dead body, both in Casey's car, as well as in her parents' backyard where Casey and Kaylee had lived before Casey ran off. In addition to this, Casey's mom had admitted that she saw Kaylee Anthony after June 9th. So although Casey says that Kaylee was kidnapped on June 9th, her mom saw her after that, so she couldn't have been kidnapped. So when this evidence was presented to the judge, the judge was highly disturbed and stated that Casey appeared to be very unemotional, unaffected by all of this. And as a result, she set Casey's bond at $500,000. Now. Casey's bond ended up being posted by a California bounty hunter who thought that Casey would help lead them to Kaylee's body. This didn't happen, but she was arrested shortly thereafter, again, for stealing checks from a friend of hers. She didn't stay in jail long because again, her bond was posted by a group of people who got together and combined their money and paid her bond. This time she's released is September 5th, 2008. And then on October 14, 2008, she is formally charged with first degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter, and four counts of providing false information to law enforcement. 10 days after she's officially charged, on October 24, 2008, forensic reports from an examination of her car showed that a hair strand discovered in the trunk was microscopically similar to those found on Kaylee Anthony's hairbrush. In addition to this, they said that the hair strand showed 
characteristics of apparent decomposition. The forensic report also showed that from an air sample that was taken from the trunk of Casey's car, the air sample was found to contain chemical compounds consistent with human decomposition. Then in December 2008, so about a month and a half later, Kaylee's bones are found in a bag in the woods less than a half a mile from Casey's parents' home. The skull was found with duct tape around the nose, mouth, and jaw, but the advanced state of composition prevented them from determining the exact cause and date of death. The duct tape on her skull allegedly had an outline of a heart-shaped sticker, which matched a heart-shaped sticker found near Kaylee's body and a pair of heart-shaped scissors found in Casey's bathroom. And then shortly after that, Casey's father was taken into custody after attempting suicide at a hotel in Florida. So all of these things leading up to the trial are just very fishy, although they're not determinative, unfortunately. We can make our assumptions based on what we know, and I think maybe we may <laughs> all be on the same page, but nothing so far is determinative. So the case goes to trial in May of 2011. The prosecution starts their opening statement by saying, you know, Casey is the single mother who didn't want the burden of a child. She wanted to continue partying, which she did continue partying after her daughter allegedly went missing. And she used chloroform to suffocate her daughter and kill her because she just didn't want this burden anymore. The defense's opening statement was that Kaylee Anthony had accidentally drowned in the family pool at Casey's parents' house and Casey's dad actually covered up the accidental drowning and, and buried her body because he, he, wanted to, he didn't want to get in trouble for it. Her lead defense attorney also asserted that Casey was molested as a child by her father, which led to her habitual lying and said that the person that found the bag of bones had planted it there. So that's what they opened up their case with. So Casey's father denies ever molesting her. He denies ever covering up any sort of accidental death. He says that this is totally untrue and never happened. One of the state's key witnesses was the manager from the tow truck company that had impounded her car. And he said that in his 30 years of doing this, he had see, he had been around cars that had dead, dead bodies in them and had smelled what those cars smelled like. And based on his knowledge and his experience, he thought that Casey's car had a very similar smell to the other cars that had had dead bodies in them. The state also presented the testimony of a software designer who testified that the computer at Casey's parents' home where Casey lived with Kaylee and her parents had, you know, he testified to the searches on the computer and he said that the word chloroform had been searched 84 times and there were other searches such as uh, spleen rupture, head injury, chest trauma, things of that nature. The witness testified that these searches were done in March 2008. We know that Kaylee died somewhere around June 2008, but the software designer then testified that there was an error in his reporting and chloroform actually wasn't searched 84 times. There was just one time that a site related to chloroform was visited, but it, was, it wasn't searched 84 times. So I think that kind of helped Casey's case in a way because it diminished all the credibility of that witness. Whereas if the credibility was never put into question, that could have been some strong testimony, you know, in favor of the prosecution's case. But because there was that error, totally wiped out the credibility, I think, and kind of helped Casey in a way. Now, Casey's mom testified on her behalf and said that she was actually the one who searched chloroform and it was a Casey and she had only searched it one time. She also testifies that the stain found in the trunk that she had originally thought was a stain from a dead body had actually been there for eight years before they even bought the car. And she also testified that the smell that she previously said smelled like a dead body really only smelled like a box of pizza that had been left in the backseat of the car for 12 days. So she totally backtracked on that statement. The trial concluded in July of 2011. There were six weeks of testimony, 400 pieces of evidence presented, and Casey was ultimately found not guilty. Now here's the thing, knowing what you know, you have to look at the burden of proof. And in this situation, in criminal cases, the state has the burden of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So you cannot have any reasonable doubts about this case. They had to have proved it beyond that. And the reality is, that while Casey lied and she did some very, very, very unsettling, 
questionable things, such as not reporting her daughter missing, there was no hard evidence. There was no DNA evidence. There was no fingerprints. There was no cause of death. There was no motive. None of this existed. So you have to look at all of that when determining whether or not the state proved their burden. If they didn't prove their burden, then the jury can't return a guilty verdict. They just can't. So in fact, when some of the jurors were questioned about their decision to render a not guilty verdict, one of the jurors said, I didn't say she was innocent. I just said there wasn't enough evidence. Another juror said they expected DNA evidence and fingerprints from the prosecution. So let's fast forward 10 years when the judge was actually interviewed as well as some of the jurors. 10 years later, the judge said that he thought the state proved its case and that while there may have been some flaws, there was a high probability that Casey would be found guilty of some form of homicide, which I don't necessarily disagree with. When some jurors were interviewed 10 years later, they said that the reason they came back with not guilty was because the state couldn't prove how Kaylee died. So like I said, there was no cause of death. There was no date of death. You know, the body was so decomposed that they couldn't determine that. So you really have to look at, you know, if these things would have been known, I think that the verdict would have been a lot different, but there were a lot of pieces of the puzzle that had not yet been put, that they hadn't been put together. The state did not complete the puzzle. Now, this isn't super important because this happened five years after the trial, but I took note of it anyway, because I wanted to bring it up. There was an affidavit made public that was signed by a private investigator who worked with Casey Anthony's defense attorney, Jose Baez. And essentially what the affidavit said was that Baez had admitted to him, the private investigator, that Casey admitted to killing her daughter and that Baez and Casey were in a sexual relationship and she would pay him for his attorney services with sexual favors. Obviously, Jose Baez, her defense attorney, totally denies that. If, you, if you're not familiar with what an affidavit is, it's essentially a sworn statement. So when there's no other evidence essentially to prove what you're saying, you sign a sworn statement that says basically everything I'm saying is true and did happen. So that's what an affidavit is. I mean, it was five years after the trial, so what does it really matter? Casey is living in Florida still. She actually has her own private investigator company as of 2020. So she is just living life. But that is the Casey Anthony trial. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. If you were a juror, would you have returned a guilty or not guilty verdict? I'm really curious. So please let me know in my comments. Let me know if you have any questions about anything. Let me know what other high profile cases you would like me to discuss. And I will see you next time.